In February of 2024, I went to the Hunt Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a bar, to finish up my story on Drunk Judge of the Tulsa County District Court's Sharon Holmes. Upon discovering that Drunk Judge Sharon Holmes was there in the bar once again, consuming shot after shot and white claw after white claw, while watching her about eight-year-old grandchild, whom we've watched her leave with in the past, hand in hand, and drive drunk, we called the Tulsa Police Department, and they responded, and a whole lot of nothing is what happened. Officer, is somebody going to talk to me? Can I get a report number or something? No? Nothing from nobody? Our audience that's been watching the channel for a while has certainly seen the videos of Drunk Judge Holmes. For those of you who are not so familiar, here's a quick little flashback. Well, hey, everybody. We came down to the Hunt Club today because we were doing a little final shots for a story we've been working on related to Judge Sharon Holmes, a judge of the district court in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're going to join us as we confront uh, the final showdown of drunk Judge Holmes tries to drive a minor uh, in our attempts to try to stop her from doing that. Now, I want you to understand, we tried to handle this in a different way. I have phoned the Tulsa Police Department and advised them of her prior behavior and what's about to transpire. And what they told me that I could do was stop her if she engages in it, but until she gets in the car and tries to drive, they're of no use. Nothing to say about her getting drunk in the hunt club at the bar and driving her grandkid? Nothing about that? You have nothing to say? She's called her bailiff, y'all. She's called her bailiff to bail her out of trouble. She's called another employee of the Tulsa County court system to bail her out. That is her bailiff, y'all. We'll see if 911 shows up. They won't show up for a woman who's repetitively driving a drunk child. We'll see if they'll show up for a judge calling for getting caught drinking and about to drive a kid at the bar. So can I get a report number or something so we can follow up on this? Should I stick around? Nothing appears though. Now, after that incident, drunk Judge Holmes goes and uses her colleague, Judge Radford, to obtain a protective order against me. And since February of 2024, I have been fighting against that protective order, trying to get Judge Radford, her employee, to recuse herself. And I finally succeeded in doing so, and I filed a motion to dismiss her protective order. And just before the hearing on the motion to dismiss, Judge Holmes dismissed her protective order. So I took Judge Holmes' protective order case, and I used that to have subpoena powers, to subpoena all our judge friends that have communications, to all of her colleagues, the police departments, etc., for all of the evidence I wanted to fight her bogus protective order. So I issued those subpoenas just a couple of days ago, and I set the deadline for them to respond and provide me the documents this Friday, all knowing that this hearing was set for today. Now, I didn't expect it to go quite this fast, but I did hope that with me issuing those subpoenas, they would see the easiest way out to quashing them, and quashing means just killing them. The easiest way out would be to dismiss the case. Now that she's dismissed the protective order case, those subpoenas are absolutely dead. Nobody has to respond to them because there's no longer a case. After I learned that morning that Judge Holmes had dismissed her protective order, I made the decision to go and exercise my constitutional right that had been deprived of me for about seven months as a result of Judge Sharon Holmes and Judge Radford's inappropriate behavior. I went to the floor where Judge Holmes was located and where her courtroom was located, a floor I had been prohibited to go to as a result of that protective order since February of 2024. Upon arriving on that floor, I did what I planned on doing, and I walked in to her courtroom. And the courtroom was filled with a whole lot of people. And immediately upon seeing me, she, Judge Holmes sees me, and her bailiff, Morgan Williams, who you saw in the flashback, also saw me. And it's like a pin could drop. And I decided at that particular point that my best course of action was just to turn around and walk out the door. So I kind of did this, I turned around, and I left. I need you guys to stay over there by the
care what she told us. I don't care what she wants. I'm coming in the courtroom unless you're coming under threat of arrest. I can't come in the courtroom. Like, are you kidding? Come over here. Oh, yeah. I'm just... Why are you doing this? Huh? Well, that's weird. That's weird. She didn't, like, she didn't like me walking into her courtroom. After leaving the courtroom, an officer comes over and tells me I'm prohibited from coming back in the courtroom, which is not appropriate because, again, I did not do anything wrong when I was in the courtroom. Walking in and kind of making a gesture like this and turning around and leaving is not a contemptible offense, or so I thought. Upon getting into the hallway uh, and having this conversation, apparently Judge Holmes decided that she was going to to take additional actions. Now, again, this is the same Judge Holmes who's filed a judicial complaint against me, who I have sued, and she's decided that she is going to exercise jurisdiction and orders me through the Sheriff's Department back into her chamber areas. Turn it that way, turn it that way. Turn it that way. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. Hurry, 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 hurry. Judge wants to see you. No, thank you. No, you have I'm requesting order. a Rule 15. Sir, step in here with the judge. I'm being ordered to? Okay. No cameras allowed in here. Wait. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't push him. Don't push him. Immediately upon getting back to her chamber areas, I requested a Rule 15. And in the state of Oklahoma, the rules of the district court, Rule 15, is a rule that says that I have the right to request a judge to recuse if I believe that there's going to be some kind of impropriety or a lack of impartiality. So I immediately requested a Rule 15, and that strips the judge of her jurisdiction. Your Honor, I'm asking you to recuse from this matter to go to Rule 15. Despite that, despite the fact that I made that Rule 15 request, Judge Holmes orders me to be held in contempt and held without bond. Now, bond in the United States is only supposed to be there to ensure that you appear when you're required to appear for a court date. Bond is not supposed to be punitive, but that's exactly what Judge Holmes did, is she held me without bond as a punitive measure for me exposing her as a drunk lush. As a result of that, I was taken from Judge Holmes' chambers and taken down to an area in the Tulsa County Courthouse where I was processed by one of the sheriff's deputies. Back, hey, Lee, go, to, go upstairs to Judge Moody's office. Judge Moody's on the fourth floor and let her know what just happened. And get me out of jail let Bree know. Yep. Upon them processing me there, I was then put in the back of a transport vehicle with no AC that was probably 100 and something degrees and no lights, and I was transported to David L. Moss. Upon arriving at David L. Moss, I was having an absolute and complete panic attack as a result of my heart issues. And quite frankly, being locked in the back of a box van in a tight area with a hundred and something degree heat and no way you can possibly escape yourself is inhumane and should never happen to anybody. But that's what happened to me. Upon getting to David L. Moss, I wasn't going to be able to be bonded out. So I ended up having to go through the whole process, the strip search, uh, the, uh, the lift and uh, bend and all of those things that they do to dehumanize somebody when they go into jail and I was placed into a solitary confinement cell. Now fortunately I have something that a lot of others don't. I have a wonderful audience that really fights for what we're fighting for. In a matter of a few hours somehow this gets to the Oklahoma Supreme Court and the Oklahoma Supreme Court issues an order that Judge Jefferson Sellers would hear my contempt case that afternoon. Now, interestingly, and something that I take significant issue with, is Judge Sellers used to be a judge, and he retired more than five years ago, and somehow he was appointed by the Oklahoma Supreme Court to hear some cases for Judge Radford, yes, the same Judge Radford who issued the protective order against me, and he was hearing her cases, and they assigned him specially to hear this case. So at the end of the day, I'm going to have my case heard by a judge who's been appointed by the Oklahoma Supreme Court, who has suspended me from practicing law for, among other things, ridiculing the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I'm going to do it when he's never been elected to anything, and he's not an, he's not an appropriate judge in the first place. And 
they're going to take me back over to the Tulsa County Courthouse in shackle and, and wrist cuffs, parade me through the courthouse to his courtroom, where it was Judge Radford's courtroom, and I sit in the jury box, and I'm made to argue for myself while in full wrist and leg shackles. Now, I request additional time for which to call witnesses, including a lot of the people that were in the courtroom upstairs. I ask for additional time to obtain counsel, and I'm granted neither. Instead, Judge Sellers orders Judge Holmes Bailiff, Morgan Williams, who has anti-websites about me, to come down and testify about what she saw. Now, interestingly, Morgan Williams testified that immediately when I walked in there, into the courtroom, I didn't say anything, and that all I kind of did was this. She confirmed that. She also confirmed that immediately upon walking in Judge Holmes' chambers that I asked her to recuse. She confirmed that as well. Despite that, and despite my requests for additional time, Judge Sellers said that I should have known that walking into that courtroom and making that gesture would disrupt a trial. And I should have known that a trial was going on, despite the fact that there were no signs outside. His logic was, if you look through the glass, you could have seen that there was a trial going on. Well, you watch the video and you form your own opinions. Now, I offered Judge Sellers to watch these videos and told them that we had all of this documented on 4K video. He refused to grant me the additional time. Now, fortunately, and quite frankly, what I think Judge Sellers was doing was he was trying to find a way to do what we call in the law, split the baby. He didn't want to rule against one of his colleagues and find that I wasn't in contempt. So he wanted to back Judge Holmes, play, and ensure that he protected her by finding me in contempt. So he finds me in contempt, and then he sentences me to time served. Now, I call that being afraid to do the right thing. And he was trying to protect his drunk judge colleague, and quite frankly, I had tried cases in front of Judge Sellers, and I lost a lot of respect for that man that day because he knew what he was doing was wrong, and he was just trying to solve the problem. And I appreciate him letting me out on time served, but the fact of the matter is that was not contempt, and I shouldn't have been convicted. Now, I am appealing that conviction, and I have filed an appeal, and that's going to be a long process, but I have filed that. I'm going to fight that, despite the fact that I was only sentenced to time served and I don't have to. I am fighting that because right is right and wrong is wrong. After being sentenced to time served, one would think that the sheriff's deputies that are there in the building would release me from the cuffs, at least take me back over to the jail to get my clothes back and my personal belongings. But that's not what happened. Instead, I am marched back to the jail, continually in shackles and in chains, in that same back of that same van, and then I am taken to David L. Moss, the jail, and I am put back into solitary confinement where I am there for hours and begin experiencing severe chest pain. And it is only upon speaking to Sean on the phone while I'm in my cell that I am able to convey the chest pain that's going on and the problems that I'm having. And the, the, the jail would not give me any of my medication. They had my medication in the lobby and the jail would not get me my medication. And they were saying it could take anywhere from two to 12 hours to process me out, despite the fact that I had already served the ridiculous sentence that I had been given. Can I talk to a supervisor? Ron Durbin called me from his cell telling me that he's got chest pains and nobody's doing anything. You don't have to talk to him, you can go there. You don't have to talk to him? No, really? You just told her you don't have to talk to me? <laughs> Are you serious? Upon having heart issues, they finally changed their mind and decided to process me quickly and get me out of the place. You have reached 911 emergency. Here he is. Please stay on the line. Wait, he's here? I'm here. Okay, go here. Hold you have the nitro? Somebody got the nitro? Yeah, he's going to get it. Hey, Lori. Hey, they violated your squad standards not allowing you that. Oh my god. It hurts so bad. Yep, nitro. I gotta sit down. Nitro is a prohibited. Oh, there he is. Man, I got to have some nitro. After getting out, I was able to get some nitro and uh, begin to feel uh, somewhat better and get back to normal in a couple of hours and get that chest pain to resolve. I didn't even single finger salute. You didn't even get that. I didn't finger, I didn't flip her off. 
I legitimately, it was like the most awkward thing. I walked in, Sean, I waved, at, I, it was like awkward silence. Everybody looked at me. I like wave in awkward silence. I turn around and leave. And that's all I did. All of this happened because drunk Judge Holmes wanted some retribution. Now here's the thing. I filed a judicial complaint against drunk Judge Holmes as a result of her drinking and driving. That has been investigated by the Oklahoma Council on Judicial Complaints, of which you can see some of the correspondence in this video. Now, they have investigated these things. They have met with the private investigator. They have spoken to the witnesses. And the Oklahoma Council on Judicial Complaints has packaged this all up, and they have sent it to the Chief Justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. That guy. That guy is now in charge of deciding what happens next with drunk Judge Holmes. He can do anything from nothing and let her go to ordering a trial to remove her from the bench. We at Guerrilla Publishing believe that the only appropriate sanction for drunk Judge Holmes is removal from the bench. And we would strongly encourage you and all of our viewers to reach out to Judge Kane and all of the members of the Oklahoma Supreme Court whose email addresses are on the screen now and urge them to get rid of drunk Judge Holmes. In the description below, you can find an email that we have prepared for you to copy and paste, along with all of the email addresses for all of the members of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. While sending that email, I would ask that you also urge them to back off of the ridiculousness of having suspended my license for engaging in free speech, exposing judicial corruption, and calling out the Oklahoma Supreme Court, other judges and lawyers in the state of Oklahoma for being corrupt. Let them know that the kind of behavior that I am exhibiting is the kind of behavior that all lawyers should be exhibiting. It's time to do what's hard in America. We thank you for your support and have a great night. The entire video about drunk judge Holmes. Y'all are killing well, Ron is fighting off these birds. Go we really appreciate it. If you went down there and hit that like and subscribe button, it really helps us out and helps support what we're doing. Thank you all so much and see you in the next video.